so far, everything we've talked about with regards to cloud microphysics has been with respect to warm clouds, clouds that only contain liquid water. If we want to talk about actual clouds in the atmosphere, we have to start talking about ice, because most clouds in the atmosphere are actually mixed phase, which means that they have both liquid water and ice present. And then there's another subset of clouds which contain only ice, which we refer to as glaciated clouds. So what do we know about ice and clouds? Well, we know that cloud condensation nuclei number concentrations range between 50 and 1,000 number per cubic centimeter. Ice nuclei, on the other hand, uh, are very rare. Uh, they're generally speaking less than 10 per cubic meter, which is a huge volume compared to a cubic centimeter. And generally speaking, ice nuclei are much less than one per cubic meter. So because ice nuclei are rare, uh, there are certain things that are observed in the atmosphere. And the first is that supercooled water is common at temperatures all the way down to minus 20. It just means that in a given cloud droplet, there's not a good ice nuclei uh, because ice nuclei are rare. We also know that water uh, will spontaneously freeze upon itself at minus 40 degrees Celsius. So there is no ice nuclei required at minus 40, and that puts a, a lower bound on the temperature at which you can observe uh, supercooled droplets. We also observe that small droplets are less likely to contain an ice nuclei, and as a result, large droplets tend to be the ones that freeze first. Um, <clears throat> and the small droplets are the ones that are more likely to remain supercooled. And of course, we know that the best ice nuclei is ice itself. It has the perfect lattice structure to nucleate an ice crystal. Ice nuclei, because they are so rare, are very difficult to measure in the atmosphere. So most of the time, we refer to laboratory results. And the laboratory results can define ice nuclei into three groups. The really good ice nuclei that nucleate between 0 and minus 5, the moderately good between minus 5 and minus 10, and the not so good between minus 10 and minus 15, and things that uh, don't nucleate uh, at, until temperature is colder than minus 15 are really not very good ice nuclei at all. But if you look at the list of really good ice nuclei, you have ice itself, you have testosterone and cholesterol. Hopefully there's not too much of that in the atmosphere, except maybe near a football game. Uh, we also have AGI, and then we have some bacteria have been shown in the laboratory to nucleate ice at temperatures as warm as minus two. But you can imagine that that's an exceptionally difficult thing to try and figure out which bacteria are actually in the air uh, and which ones might act as ice nuclei. In the minus five to minus 10, we have some very common ones. We have uh, things that you've probably heard about. Uh, silver iodide uh, was one of the things that was discovered back in the 1940s as a good uh, ice nuclei. Uh, silver iodide, mercury iodide, uh, copper uh, sulfide, um, and kaolinite. Kaolinite is a naturally occurring mineral that occurs in many mineral dusts. Um, and then we have the minus 10 to minus 15 volcanic ash, uh, cadmium iodide, and vermiculite, which is another uh, type of uh, mineral. The other thing that we know about ice crystals is that they have certain habits, and habits refers to crystal shape. Uh, we have hexagonal plates, we have needles, we have columns, and we have dendrites. And I'm going to show you um, some PowerPoint slides to actually demonstrate what these actually look like. And as this screen is starting to come up, what it's going to show you is it's going to show you that the ice crystal habit actually depends upon two things. The first thing that it depends upon is temperature, and the second thing it depends upon is the amount of water vapor that's present in the atmosphere. Generally speaking, the more water vapor that's present in the atmosphere, the more complex the shape of the crystal is going to be. So <clears throat> we generally divide this up into temperatures between zero and minus four, uh, the most common type of crystal to form in those is basically hexagonal plates, unless you have really high water concentrations, and then you can get dendrites uh, at that temperature between zero and minus four. 
Between minus 4 and minus 10, the most common type of crystal is actually needles. Uh, because most of the time we are super saturated with respect to water and so we end up with needles. Uh, between minus 10 and minus 22, uh, the most common type of crystal is a dendrite or sectored plates which are basically hexagonal plates with hexagonal plates on the corners. And then at temperatures, nucleation temperatures, uh, between uh, colder than minus 22, uh, we generally end up with hexagonal columns and sometimes these are hollow and sometimes they're not. Uh, but you can see that the temperature, if you, if you look at an individual ice crystal, you can generally tell exactly what temperature that ice crystal formed at because each of these ice crystal habits forms in a different temperature regime. So here are some examples of hexagonal plates. Uh, you have your basic hexagonal plate, which is sectored. Uh, you have a hexagonal plate, which has hexagonal plates at each of the uh, ver vertex of each of the one of theirs. And then you have one that's even more complex. All of these uh, fall under the category of hexagonal plates. Uh, dendrites. This is what you think of when you think of as a snow crystal, uh, a snowflake. But a snowflake is much, much bigger than an individual ice crystal. And as a result, uh, it takes hundreds if not thousands of ice crystals to form a single snowflake, which is why you end up with the adage that no two snowflakes are alike. But you can see how a dendritic crystal, uh, when it collides with another crystal, would lock in place in uh, different ways every time, and you end up with some beautiful uh, crystal structure out of that. Um, here you have an example of a hollow column. Uh, it's basically a hexagonal plate that has grown along this axis and it's hollow in the middle. Uh, here we happen to have a hexagonal column with two hexagonal plates that have been put on the end. Um, I refer to this as the TIE Fighter from Star Wars, if you can think about that. And here we happen to have a uh, long uh, hexagonal column that has needles that are growing off of it. And you can imagine the complexity of what can occur in nature in terms of the growth of all of these different kinds of uh, crystals um, with different temperature regimes. So this was a, a, a crystal that was growing in a, a temperature range when a hexagonal column would be good and then moved to a different temperature range uh, and needles started to form on top of this. Uh, so each one of these crystals preserves a history of the formation of that crystal which makes them both complex and uh, beautiful as well.